Thank you for looking up part two of the nervous system lecture. Of course, this is for your benefit. And again, this is part two. Hopefully you're very well acquainted with the first part of this lecture, part one, and also the muscular system. In this portion of the lecture, we're going to spend a great deal of time um, of dissecting the brain and the different parts and looking at the structures and the functions of the brain for the most part. So we are going to start off with the cranial meninges and these would basically the layered, these are the layers, the cranial meninges are the layers, the layered membranes in the skull. What you're going to see is that bones and membranes and fluids surround the organs of the central nervous system and these, the meninges have three layers. These layers help to provide the brain and spinal cord with stability. It also helps out with shock absorption. So when we look from the most superficial to the deepest layers, you would see that the first one would be the dura mater, and that would be the outermost layer. It's the most superficial. And then we have the arachnoid outer. Then we have the arachnoid, um, a very thin web-like membrane that does not have blood in it. Okay, no blood vessels, I should say. And then we have the pia matter. And the pia matter is very thin and it contains a lot of nerves and blood vessels that nourish the underlying cells of the brain and spinal cord. So in this diagram, we are able to view the layers, and again, you would see that the most superficial layer would be the dura matter right here, and the dura matter, again, is the outermost layer, and you'll see that it has a tough, white, fibrous covering over it, over it. that is connective tissue, and this has blood vessels and nerves, and it forms the internal periosteum of the surrounding skull bones. So the dura mater isolates bone from the tissue of the brain. The arachnoid, which would be deep to the dura mater, the arachnoid, that is thin and a, a web-like type membrane. The arachnoid layer has no blood vessels and um, again, it lies between the dura mater and the pia mater. Between the arachnoid and the pia mater, I just want to point out something here. Between the arachnoid and the pia mater is the subarachnoid space. And the subarachnoid space is where you can find CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. And the subarachnoid space is a delicate network of collagen and elastin fibers. So I'll just write it right here. Network of collagen. <laughs> Ran out of space. And elastin fibers. So that's what the subarachnoid space is. Okay. Now, deep to the subarachnoid space, we have the pia matter. And the pia matter, again, is very thin, contains many nerves and blood vessels that nourish the underlying cells of the brain and the spinal cord. And this layer hugs and contours to the brain and spinal cord. If there's a blow to the head, you can break the blood vessels and the escaping blood collects under the dura matter. So, you break the blood vessels and under the dura mater, the blood will collect and cause pressure between the bones of the skull and the soft tissue of the brain. And that's when you hear people, when they have like fluid, let's say, on their brains, it would be because of some blow perhaps to the head, some sort of trauma, and they'll have to go in and evacuate it by drilling holes into the skull so that that fluid could be released. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, deep to the arachnoid space is the subarachnoid space, and it contains CSF, and this CSF has a role, okay, it, a function, 
It um, cushions and protects. The organs of the CNS. Okay. So once again, the CSF cushions the central nervous system. It supports the brain. The brain is floating around inside of the CSF. So it's a great shock absorber. And it also helps transport nutrients and wastes. Okay, let's talk about the spinal cord for a bit, which is part of the central nervous system. It's the spinal cord and the brain. The spinal cord is a slender nerve column that passes down from the brain into the vertebral canal. So you can see starting right here at the base of the brain, um, the, it's continuous with the brain, but it starts where the nervous tissue leaves the cranial cavity at the foramen magnum, that hole in the skull, right? So this is where it starts. The spinal cord ends at the area that we call L1 or L2, right around here. This is where the spinal cord ends. And um, the reason why it ends there is because it grows only until an individual is about four years old. So the spinal cord does not go for the entire length of the vertebral column. Okay. So it ends around the first and second lumbar vertebrae. The spinal cord has several nerves, which are part of the PNS. And these will branch into various parts of the body and connect them to the CNS. So it functions in many reflexes, like withdrawal and your patellar reflexes, since the reflex arcs that we talked about in the last lecture pass through the spinal cords. So the spinal cord is continuous with the brain, but it does not start until the level of the foramen magnum. And it goes until the L1 or L2, which is the first and second lumbar vertebrae. Again, as I mentioned before, the spinal, growth, the spinal cord growth stops at about four years of age, and so this is why it does not go the entire length of the vertebral column. And um, But the vertebral column bones, you would see that those continue to grow until you have reached your full height. The nerves of the lower spinal cord exit the vertebral column much lower in a bundle of nerves called the cauda equina. Cauda equina. Oops, that should be. So jumping back to that slide that we were on previously, uh, the spinal cord, you're going to see that there is a portion in the neck region that is right around what I'm circling right now. It's a thickened por portion or an enlarged portion called the cervical enlargement. That is going to supply nerves to the upper limbs. And then um, there's a similar thickening in the lower back right around here and that will be called the lumbar enlargement and this gives off nerves to the you guessed it the lower limbs this slide shows you a transverse section of the spinal cord the spinal cord has a central canal that is filled with cerebral spinal fluid it is not illustrated on this picture, so I am going to circle the central canal, that little hole right there, and that's filled with cerebrospinal fluid. The posterior surface has a shallow groove, which we call a sulcus, which I will show right here. That's your sulcus. And then the anterior portion has even has an even deeper groove called the fissure. The fissure and the sulcus separate the spinal cord into right and left halves. I also want to point out that this spinal cord, when you look at this sectional section of the spinal cord, 
it has this area that is light colored and then on the inside there's this rough looking H that is darker. The superficial area that I pointed out previously would be white matter and that contains myelinated and unmyelinated axons and then there's the gray matter that I pointed out that forms a rough H that would be dominated by cell bodies of neurons and glial cells around the central canal. So once again, you have the white matter, which is dominated by myelinated and unmyelinated axons. And then you have the gray matter, which is dominated by cell bodies of neurons. That's why it, it has that color, so to speak. The dorsal region of the spinal cord or the posterior region is another way of putting it, contains axons that bring sensory information to the spinal cord. So this is going to go from the PNS to the CNS. So of course that would be afferent. Now, what do you think would happen if some part of the dorsal region is severed? Okay. Of course, if it's severed, the incoming sensory info is disrupted. So the information that's coming from the PNS to the CNS, the incoming info is disrupted. And then, of course, there is the ventral region, or another name for that would be anterior. And this contains axons of the CNS motor neurons that control muscles and glands. So the ventral, let's go down here. This will contain axons of the CNS which control muscles and glands. So this means that the, these neurons are going to give rise to motor fibers that go from spinal nerves to skeletal muscle as well. In other words, the information is going from the CNS to the PNS. And so, of course, we call this efferent. Okay, so let's talk about the gray matter of the spinal cord. If I were to draw a rough spinal cord, which again, I know my drawings are the worst, All right? We have the little fissure and the sulcus, that deep groove. Then you have the sulcus, okay. Then here's your central canal. And then around that, you have that portion, looks like that. So this portion on the inner this portion that I'm drawing gray, let's say, or coloring gray, that would be considered the gray matter. And it is, it's um, made up or it contains mostly cell bodies and interneurons. So the projections of gray matter that extend 
through the white matter to what the outer surface of the spinal cord are called horns. So these little projections will be considered horns. Since this area would be the anterior fissure, this is the anterior side of the spinal cord, so this horn would be considered this horn, right, that I'm thickening up right here. Let me put it in another color for you. That would be considered the anterior horn. So here it is. These are the anterior horns. And then we have this portion at the posterior end. So we call this, or the dorsal end, we call that the dorsal horn or posterior horn. And next we have this portion on the sides that I'm putting in green. We call that the lateral horn. So the dorsal horn is responsible for sensory information. It contains sensory nuclei. And then the ventral horn, or the anterior horn, is concerned with the motor control of skeletal muscles. So for the dorsal horn, I'll write it in, it contains sensory nuclei. Okay, so it's sensory. And then the ventral or the anterior horn is control with is concerned, I'm sorry, with the motor control of skeletal muscles. The lateral horns are only in the thoracic and upper lumbar areas, and these contain visceral motor neurons that control smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. So this controls smooth muscle, cardiac, and glands. So these are involuntary. Next we have the commissures, the gray commissures, and these interconnect the horns on either side of the spinal cord. Now the gray matter, which we just covered, extends into the white matter. The white matter would be longitudinal bundles. of myelinated axons. I know I mentioned this before. And these make up the major neural pathways. Gray matter divides the white matter into three regions on each side, which we call the funicular columns. You have the lateral, the anterior, and the posterior. Each funiculus has bundles of myelinated axons that make up neural pathways. In the CNS, the central nervous system, these bundles of axons are called tracks. The tracks consist of axons that provide a two-way communication system between the brain and body parts. In this diagram, I would like to point out the funiculi or the columns. That's another name for it, so you can either say funiculi or columns. And here we have the posterior funiculi. Of course, that goes along, we call this portion the posterior sulcus. And then we have the anterior funiculi, right around here. And then we also have the lateral funiculi. So you can see that the names go along with the same positioning 
as the horns. Now remember, just a few moments ago, I said that each funiculus has bundles of myelinated axons that make up neural pathways. In the central nervous system, these bundles of axons are called tracts, and you have the dorsal column, which is associated with the ascending tract, and these carry sensory info to the brain. And then you have the ventral column, which is associated with the descending tract, and these will take info from the brain. So it takes it from the brain to muscles and glands. The names of the tracts identify where they originate and where they terminate. So the spinothalamic tract originates in the spinal cord, it begins there, and it carries the sensory impulse to the thalamus of the brain. Whereas the ventral, or I'm sorry, or the descending tract, the descending tract or the corticospinal tract, that begins in the cortex of the brain and carries motor impulses downward to control the skeleton. Now that we've talked about the spinal cord, let's move on to the other part of the central nervous system, which is the brain. The brain is divided into four major regions. You have the cerebral hemispheres, that's the cerebral hemisphere. You have the diencephalon. There would be the brain stem, and we also have the cerebellum. Because I did not have enough room, I know it looks really convoluted up here, but again, the regions would be the cerebral hemisphere, diencephalon, the brainstem and the cerebellum. The diencephalon includes the thalamus and the hypothalamus, and the brainstem includes the midbrain, the pons, the medulla oblongata, and reticular formation. And the cerebellum simply includes the cerebellum. Now, when we look at this view, the frontal section of the brain, you can see that the cerebrum, which is the largest part of the brain, consists of two large masses. So I can divide this in half, and you have the left and right cerebral hemisphere, and they mirror each other. Inside, you can see an area called the corpus callosum, and this is a broad bundle of axons that connects the hemispheres to each other. The ridges on the surface of the cerebrum are called gyri, which are separated by grooves. The grooves are called a sulcus, which are shallow, and fissures, which are deep. So I'll point out the shallow sulci in green. And then you have the deeper fissures that I'll point out in blue. So the ridges of the cerebrum are the gyri and the grooves, if they're shallow, consider the sulcus and the deeper grooves are the fissures. The cerebral lobes provide higher brain function. The sulci divide the hemisphere into the lobes and they're named after the bones that they underlie. So hopefully you can remember the frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital bones. Well, the lobes of the brain, those are named after the bones that are over them. So the frontal lobe controls intellectual processes such as decision-making, planning, concentration. It even is concerned with personality. But it also 
has some motor control, control of the skeletal muscles, and it includes something that we call the Broca's area. And the Broca's area in the left hemisphere, it generates movements of muscles necessary for speech. The parietal lobe provides sensations from the skin and other somatic sensations also arise here. Remember, so the somatic sensations or som somatic would be the peripheral nervous system. The parietal lobe also is partly responsible for sensory speech and word formation. The temporal lobe is partially responsible for the interpretation of speech. So whenever you hear something, auditory information, the temporal lobe helps interpret that. And there's an area called the Wernicke's area that is your general interpretive area. So the Wernicke's area is where the occipital, parietal, and temporal lobes meet and integrates and interprets sensi sensory info. Lastly, there is the occipital lobe, which is responsible for visual images, being able to perceive visual images. So please remember each lobe and what they are responsible for. Now, at some point in your life, you may have heard that the brain, the left part of the brain controls the right side of you and the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body. Well, this, that entire mechanism is cerebral lateralization. Each hemisphere controls the opposite side of the body, and that is because of the decussation of fibers. Basically, the decussation means the crossing over of fibers where an X is formed. It connects the corresponding parts on the opposite side of the brain. The corpus callosum, which is that broad, flat bundle of axons that connects the cerebral hemispheres, is what joins those two hemispheres and the dura matter separates them. Even though both hemispheres look identical, there are different functions for each, so there's specialization for each hemisphere. So hopefully you spent time with the ventricle model in class. Each hemisphere of the brain contains a large lateral ventricle they don't connect directly. There's an opening called the interventricular foramen, which allows communication with the third ventricle. The midbrain has an aqueduct that connects ventricle three to four in the pons. So let's just point out the lateral ventricles. I'm highlighting them here, and each one is in a particular hemisphere. And then you have the third ventricle, and then there is the fourth ventricle. The aqueduct of the mid midbrain connects the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle. In your notes, you are only responsible for the third and fourth ventricles, which are located in the pons. So these ventricles are interconnected cavities that are inside of the cerebral hemisphere and the brainstem as well. It's continuous with the central canal of the spinal cord. And this also contains CSF. Your brain, if it were just in the air, would be about mm, a little over 3 pounds, 3.1 pounds. But when it's floating in the CSF, it's about 1.8 ounces. So you can see that the, the CSF really takes a weight off. It's lined with ependymal cells. The, the ventricles are lined with ependymal cells which hopefully you remember are the neuroglia of the CNS, and this forms an epithelial-like membrane covering the brain parts. Next, the choroid plexus is a tiny mass of specialized capillaries from the pia matter which secretes, secretes CSF. The CSF that it produces every day is around the amount of 500 milliliters. This is found in each ventricle, 
and it's composed of ependymal cells, which line the canal and spinal cord, line the canal of the spinal cord, and ventricles of the brain. Ependymal cells produce CSF, and in some areas, the cells have cilia that help circulate the fluid. Next, we are going to look at the diencephalon, and you can see that I wrote in some extra notes, so make sure you get that down. The diencephalon contains switching and relay centers that integrate conscious and unconscious sensory info and motor commands. There are many parts of the diencephalon. It's located between hemispheres above the midbrain, made of mostly gray matter. One part of the diencephalon is the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is a region that has a lot of nuclei. It maintains homeostasis because it regulates autonomic functions, such as temperature, hunger, your body weight, heart rate, blood pressure, glandular secretions, sleep, and wakefulness. It also controls your emotional responses. Here it indicates the limbic system, and the limbic system controls your emotional experience and expression. It recognizes experiences and guides a person into a survival type of behavior behavior. Smells also go to the limbic system. I don't know about you, but sometimes I might smell something and it would take me directly back into a moment when I was in Trinidad out in the backyard while my dad was cutting coconuts off of the tree just because of some particular smell. Okay, you might smell your grandma's cooking and it takes you right back into a moment in time. And that's because your smell is connected to the limbic system. Other parts of the diencephalon include the pituitary gland, which releases hormones. So the diencephalon is connected to the endocrine system. And then there's also the pineal gland, which secretes melatonin. Oops, made a little mistake there. Um, the thalamus is the central relay station. It receives all sensory impulses except smell and sends them to the appropriate regions. The diencephalon is also responsible for your circadian, I'll write it in, circadian patterns, which were, which are the repeated behaviors associated with night and day. So once again, you know I repeat myself a lot, once again you have the hypothalamus, which is responsible for hunger and thirst, regulation of temperature, sleep, wakefulness, sexual arousal, performance, and emotions. And then you also have the regulation of the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is the master gland, and that releases hormones, oxytocin, ADH, prolactin, growth hormone, follicular stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone. We'll talk about those types of hormones later in the fifth section, I believe. And the pineal gland secretes melatonin and re regulates your circadian rhythms, which are associated with patterns, repeated behaviors of, a so of night and day. Just for anatomy's sake, I am pointing out the hypothalamus in green and the thalamus I've pointed out in pink. In blue, I will illustrate the pineal gland. And unfortunately, it is not being shown here, but in class, when you play around with the brain models, you can point out the pituitary gland, which is like a little ball that's hanging. Before we move on to the other slide, I also want to point out the brain stem. The brain stem includes the midbrain or the mesencephalon, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. It's a bundle of nervous tissue that connects the cerebrum to the spinal cord. 
So just now I pointed out the, in the previous slide, the brainstem and I indicated the midbrain or the mesencephalon. It's a short section of the brainstem and it joins the lower part of the brainstem and spinal cord with the higher parts of the brain. It has several masses of gray matter that serve as reflex centers. These reflex centers respond to visual and auditory info. So it would be an example would be moving your eyes to view something or moving your head to sound. So in green, I am going to indicate the mesencephalon or the midbrain. On the following slide, I'm going to point out the medulla oblongata's functions, which I've just circled in pink. The medulla oblongata goes from the pons to the foramen magnum, all ascending and descending nerve fibers connecting the brain and the spinal cord pass through the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata controls visceral activities such as your heart rate and blood pressure. So the centers include your visceral activities will include like your cardiac center, your respiratory center, and your vasomotor center. Your cardiac center will be controlling heart rate, your respiratory center will be controlling your breathing. It maintains your rhythm of your breathing. And the vasomotor would be concerned with your blood vessel control and also helps maintain blood pressure. Before we move any further, I just want to do a write-in slide here of the pons, which I indicated earlier. The pons is a rounded bulge and it relays impulses to and from the medulla oblongata. There is a complex network of nerve fibers scattered throughout the brain stem called the reticular formation. And this is responsible for activating the cerebral cortex into a conscious state. When impulses reach the reticular formation, it responds by activating the cerebral cortex into a state of wakefulness. If there's decreased activity, activity in the reticular formation, it makes you sleep. If it's injured, you can go into an unconscious state or in a state of comatose. As we come, a come to a close in this lecture, the last structure we are going to point out of the brain is the cerebellum and I know that you also had another term called the arbor vitae that would be the little tree-like structures that are drawn within here okay the cerebellum receives information from the sensory systems and the spinal cord and other parts of the brain and then regulates motor movements It coordinates motor output, so it coordinates voluntary movements such as posture and balance, coordination, speech. It also results in a smooth, balanced muscular activity. As pointed out earlier, it is near the base of the brain and it is the second largest part of your brain. Cerebellum, if I know many individuals look at it in class and they say, oh, it looks like a tiny brain. And that is exactly what it stands for. It's Latin, it's Latin for little brain. Okay, so with that, this concludes the second part of the nervous system lecture part two. I hope that you spend a great deal of time on these lectures. Look at them over and over. Rewind. Get them into you so that you become very familiar with them. Thanks for watching.